This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode 598. We're happy to be back from our summer break, all refreshed and ready to go. Unfortunately, it's also 9-11-2020, 19 years since that fateful day. All of our thoughts are with those that uh, didn't make it through. Unfortunately, it's, uh, it's a sad day in American history. Let's uh, move forward, though. We've got great guests today, Kevin Kennedy and Larry Zarker. We're going to be talking about the new Healthy Housing Principles Reference Guide and uh, looking forward to a great discussion with the two of them. Before we get started, we thank our sponsors. They're the reason IAQ Radio is still free. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. Learn more at acgih.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute. Learn more at cirscience.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association. Learn more at iaqa.org. AIHA, healthier workplaces, a healthier world. Learn more at AIHA.org. And the Restoration Industry Association. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. IAQ Radio Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories. Learn more at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report that no one identified ASHRAE standard 170-2017 alongside HVAC design manual for hospitals and clinics as the two ASHRAE documents that provide key guidance on ventilation requirements for healthcare facilities. That was our last trivia question before summer break. The IQ radio trivia question for today, Friday, September 11th, 2020, has been sponsored by Ideas, a solution chemistry company providing unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here's today's IAQ radio trivia question. Name the group responsible for the 9-11 attacks in New York City and in Shanksville and at the Pentagon. Back to you, Joe. All right, so we've got today Kevin Kennedy. He's an environmental hygienist at the program and the program director for environmental health programs at Children's Mercy, Kansas City. The center works in patient uh, patients' homes, schools, and child care facilities, providing environmental health assessments, consulting, training, education, and they perform research in indoor environmental health. We also have Larry Zarker, the CEO of the Building Performance Institute, the professional standard setting and credentialing organization for both the weatherization and home performance contracting industries. They oversee BPI's national network of over 12,000 certified professionals and BPI Gold Star contracting companies. Welcome, gentlemen. Great to have you on board. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, it's good to see everybody. Kevin, Kevin let's, let's start with you. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed in myself. It's been quite a while since we've had you on the show, and uh, I always enjoy talking to you and, and getting caught up on things in the healthy homes, healthy buildings world. Um, I've been reading this new book, uh, Healthy Housing Principles Reference Guide. Uh, great job. Uh, more on that in a moment. First, Give us a little update on the whole Healthy Homes movement from your perspective at the hospital there. Well, being uh, brief, and that's tough for me to do, <laughs> uh, it, it has evolved uh, within the agencies. It's been around for about 20 years, and uh, it has slowly evolved and become pretty well established uh, in many uh, parts of the country, in many states. Uh, 
uh, EPA and HUD in particular uh, have had well-established programs somewhat related to healthy homes, HUD uh, very clearly related to healthy homes. But where it's really expanded, where there's really been growth has been uh, with DOE and with uh, home performance, building performance, uh, the residential side of energy efficiency. Uh, there have been some pu key publications. There have been some uh, research. Uh, there's been research in other countries about um, the role of, of comfort and thermal control and its relationship to health. And then there have been several uh, programs that have looked then at integrating uh, energy efficiency weatherization practices and uh, healthy home practices. Our program has worked for years with uh, the weatherization folks. Uh, they're locally in Kansas City, and I've been involved uh, in the home performance world and some of their conferences that had focused on energy efficiency, but they've always had talks related to indoor air quality and healthy homes. And then I've been able to go and speak more about the importance of uh, uh, health in housing and how the work they do is naturally associated with improvement of the indoor environment. You, you change the ventilation, you eat, air seal the house, uh, and you air seal the ductwork, and you improve your ability to control uh, the source air and also the quality of the air over time. And there's a clear recognition of that. And so there are, there are lots of initiatives around the country that are this combination of uh, the energy home performance world and the healthy home world. And, and lots of programs are looking to combine and integrate and collaborate uh, on those kind of activities, including healthcare systems and even uh, health insurance companies have reached out to uh, some of the state weatherization programs and talked about how they might collaborate to help chronically ill patients. Oh, yeah, that was, you kind of led right into my next question. I, I know that we've talked over the years about that and how healthcare insurance companies and so forth uh, are interested in, you know, healthy homes and, and trying to prevent some of these you know, health conditions that, that people and children, especially living in healthy homes, develop. How's that been coming along? You know, has the progress, um, are they covering any of these kind of services now, or, or is that still something we're working on? Well, uh, it's interesting. The healthcare world, uh, on average, takes 17 years to adopt a new healthcare practice. Wow. You and I and probably others on the call have been involved in home environmental health for about 20 years. Uh, some of you on the call know Dr. Jay Portnoy, who uh, is sort of our founding father there at Children's Mercy. Uh, and he has advocated within the allergy world for about that 20 years. And over the last 10 or so, there's been a clear recognition of the role of environment in uh, managing patients. And there's a huge movements uh, within the healthcare world to address the social determinants of health and uh, preventive health care. And uh, even within Medicaid and Medicare in the United States, there's been a push by those federal agencies to get uh, state Medicaid and Medicare and managed care systems to talk with their clients about uh, Pre, uh, screening for social determinants health for preventive care. As far as actual home assessments, uh, as far as I know at this point, only Missouri, the state of Missouri, has uh, adopted a formal practice for asthma patients only where there is reimbursement for a home environmental assessment that, that you have to get on a registry uh, to be an approved assessor. And then once you are, a physician can make a referral for uh, a, a patient to one of those uh, approved assessors. The service is provided and then the service can be reimbursed. Uh, but the key is that uh, you don't have to have official reimbursement from Medicaid in order to re have reimbursement for the service. Any health insurance company, any managed care insurance company that works or contracts with Medicaid or Medicare could pay for the service 
anytime they want. It can just be part of their business model that they pay for preventive services. I bet everybody on this call has had their insurance company offer them a wellness program, a wellness check, so all these preventive services. Well, that's part of their movement and philosophy in, in improving care, reducing costs is to get more uh, people enrolled or involved in some kind of preventive health and a home assessment for a whole host of health conditions would be perfectly appropriate for preventive care to, to help guide people for what things in their home uh, might be associated with uh, uh, health problems. And if you could address these things and improve the environment, uh, the research at least suggests that you would see uh, an improvement in health over time and a lowering of health care costs for those folks. Interesting. Interesting. Let's go jump over to Larry. Larry, um, we've had recently here shows with AIHA, ACGIH leadership. And, you know, of course, we've got IAQA and RIA, their sponsors, and, and Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. They have all had challenges, I want to say, as a result of the COVID pandemic. And I wondered if you could comment on how the COVID pandemic has affected BPI and its network of weatherization people? It's been challenging. Um, it's been challenging because a lot of uh, the training is done in a classroom or field environment, and that hasn't been possible. A lot of the contractors who are doing work under utility programs had to pause and not do work. Um, at the same time though, um, some of the contractors were deemed essential, uh, like HVAC contractors, plumbers, electricians continue to do work. So some parts of our uh, world actually um, had to hit pause and not go out and do their work. And many of them are now returning to the field with um, COVID safe practices uh, in place. Um, so it's, it's starting to pick back up. Um, but the HVAC industry, um, along with the home builders, they continue to do uh, work throughout the pandemic. You know, one of the things we, I don't think we discussed this the last time we had you on was the Building Performance Association. And um, I know you were a big part of, of helping pull that together. And I was just, as I asked that question, I thought to myself, I wonder, you know, what a time to start a new association, right? Right in the middle of a pandemic or just before a <laughs> pandemic. You know, so. Uh, how has that affected the BPA? Um, we spent the past three years trying to put together an industry association from a lot of nonprofits like uh, Home Energy Magazine and Affordable Comfort. And they hi we hired a CEO to come in and the first job he had was to cancel the conference in New Orleans. And he brought with him a skill set of learning management systems. And they instantly produced the virtual conference uh, for the association. They did three weeks of live broadcasts every day. We had something like 1,700 people paid to attend that conference. Um, and the live sessions, some of them had seven to 800 people on them. I, I know, Kevin, you spoke at um, some of those sessions. Uh, and then um, there, there were recorded, pre-recorded um, uh, webinar sessions. Um, Kevin, Joe, and I did one for the Healthy Housing Principles in July and uploaded it. And now people are watching that. So um, it's been very successful. Um, they're taking the momentum from the national conference and instead of doing one or two regional conferences, I think they're going to do four regional uh, virtual conferences tailored more to the specific regional area um, this fall. So, so, you know, some organizations just canceled. Uh, they couldn't do the live event, so they didn't, they didn't have the conference. Um, the Building Performance Association's really been doing a good job of uh, making it work. Adopted quickly. Well, that's Bob. Is Bob Krell, is he the gentleman you're referring to that helped these? Bob ran that conference. He did an outstanding job of managing that conference. The person who came in as a CEO is a guy named Steve Skodak, who came out of the uh, Association for the Paint Industry. 
So he wasn't exactly in the billing performance uh, industry, but he certainly um, adapted what he had been doing and brought it into to this um, um, association. Interesting. All right, let's let's talk a little bit about this new Healthy Housing Principles Reference Guide. I, I think first, uh, either one of you, uh, probably Larry might be better to discuss, what was the impetus behind the development of the guide? What's the intent? How do people get a copy of it? Um, let's take right. them one at a time, Larry. So, so we've been, we've always had health and safety as part of our standards for the work that's done in homes for a building analyst who goes in. Um, and a lot of that had to do with combustion safety and gas leak detection, but didn't actually look at the larger picture. So I think it was six or seven years ago, we were led to create a certification called the Healthy Home Evaluator. And that's a diagnostic certification that has um, a prerequisite of another certification like building analyst um, to sit for that exam. We brought that out to the marketplace. And I would say candidly, the market wasn't really ready. We have maybe 400 of these people across the country. And we realized what we needed to do is something much broader. Um, and to a much broader audience of stakeholders. So we came up with the idea of the healthy housing principles as a certificate of knowledge and also then with a reference guide that people could uh, use to study, uh, perhaps take a training from uh, one of uh, the training organizations that we partner with around the country and then be able to go out and do their work. Um, in Washington State, um, a, a county health department, Tacoma Pierce County, actually uh, their community health workers teamed up with um, uh, the weatherization uh, workers and collaborated on a strategy to go into 58 homes with 78 uh, asthma and COPD patients and they documented quality of life improvements from the collaboration. So that's what we're trying to get to is that broader audience of people who are going to be in homes and may be able to contribute um, from what they see. So is, is this, we, we talked about the Healthy Home Evaluator, I believe the last time we had you on, is this like an add on to that or a prerequisite for that? How, how does that work? It um, certainly we one way that we have um, tied them together is that um, uh, if you hold a certification from BPI and you pass this certificate of knowledge for the healthy housing principles, you get eight CEUs. So that's a pretty big deal for a renewal process. Um, the, the healthy home evaluator didn't have a reference guide and we think it's mm -hmm. excellent for anyone who has that to go back and and refer to the information that's inside. I think it'll become one of the reference guides for a healthy home evaluator. <clears throat> you might also be aware BPI has the building science principles certificate of knowledge yep. and this healthy housing principles is a nice complement to that and I have advocated to Larry that I think new people coming into the field even into the environmental field or environmental health or environmental science or even indoor air quality. Uh, building science is teaching you some of those concepts about how a uh, building acts as a system and what some of those basic principles are. And then this healthy housing principles complements that and there's a lot of overlap uh, of the two as far as building science goes and house as a system concept. Uh, but both of these could serve as a foundation for anybody who is uh, new to the field, who's trying to expand their knowledge, but also um, contractors. I can, you know, wouldn't it be great if the guy you hire to build your house had a certificate of knowledge for healthy housing principles and building science principles so that as they build the house, they're fully aware of the potential health and environmental impacts of all of their construction practices. Uh, you've had on the show a variety of people 
who are unique to the industry in that they, they go in as they frame the house and totally air seal and, and they build these super energy efficient houses that, that allow you to uh, also super control uh, the quality of the indoor environment in that house. And uh, the, this, in my mind, anybody who touches a home uh, would benefit from having the certificate and, and having this background. Because it, it, you know, the, it, it centered around the keep it principles and it, um, it allows a person to think of all of their knowledge about housing uh, based on each of those keep it principles. Well, let's, let's talk about those principles because I, years ago, I think it was probably you or, or Luke or somebody at, at Children's that introduced me to the, you know, the essentials of healthy housing. At the time, I think there were seven, um, seven keep it principles. So keep it clean, keep it dry, keep it pest free, keep it contaminant free, keep it safe, keep it ventilated and keep it maintained. And then not long ago, well, now it's probably three, four years, maybe even five, they added keep it comfortable. Um, and I've always felt like, you know, we added that into our indoor environmentalist training right away. We, we took what was a two day thing and, and kind of compressed it into a day but I always loved that framework. And, and I always felt like mm. homeowners would get it, you know, and, and it was amazing when you would talk to people in the class about those principles, how the, the light would go on. They would, they would immediately think about their own home. And when you can connect something you're learning to something in your own life, you just learn it so much better. So I, I, I love it, and I, and I love the way this book is, um, is put together, and it, it focuses on those keep it principles and adds the keep it comfortable, which I think is something that needed to be expanded on um, for some time now. I wonder if, Kevin, if you could comment on, first of all, what do you mean by keep it comfortable, and, and what are some of the key points in that keep it principle? Well, uh all great All comments, great comments, Joe. And I had the good fortune of uh, helping you uh, develop and integrate uh, the essentials and healthy home principles into uh, your trainings and uh, work on both on helping teach and also uh, on the manual. And uh, you did a wonderful job of integrating that. And, and applause to you in this industry to go back and say, this industry in my mind, the indoor air quality industry should use a foundational set of principles like that as in part for how you communicate to consumers. It's great that you have all this technical knowledge, but your jargon does not help your typical client. You got to have a, a language that you can use to communicate with them. And that's what I've always loved about the Keep It Principles is they are very simple and straightforward. Keep It Dry is about moisture management. And I don't have to go into psychrometrics and, and temperature or humidity relationships, blah, blah, blah. Keep it dry. Uh, and here's ways to do that. Uh, that that's the whole value of these keep it principles now when they came out with the uh, uh, keep it uh, actually originally they were trying to figure out the term and they they you'll find online and hud and epa still use energy efficient or thermally controlled or climate controlled or, or they had all these different uh, terms for it, but really, uh, and I uh, uh, advocated and Larry and, and some of the subject matter folks agreed, when you're talking about health in homes, it's really about people's comfort. And that's actually one of the most important healthy home principles that was not emphasized enough because a lot of the research shows that extreme temperatures, whether extreme cold or extreme heat, and, and your ability to manage that in your home is one of the major causes of death, especially for seniors, and is a major problem worldwide in housing is the ability to control temperature. So comfort is fundamentally about uh, uh, temperature and thermal control uh, and the potential health effects associated with that, but it's also of understanding and we go very briefly into understanding heat transfer through a house. Uh, the, the three basic concepts of heat transfer and then there's some nice illustrations in the guide that are also in the building science principles guide about uh, basic concepts for how um, heat is transferred through the house and then Lo and behold, what would you do to address those issues? Why uh, air sealing, insulation, duct sealing? 
what do you know, weatherization, energy efficiency work. And I would even suggest to you that in the next five years, this idea is that healthy housing becomes sort of the overarching thing and weatherization and energy becomes one of those key components uh, that has health benefits associated with it. You know, I wonder, Kevin, is there, I, I, admittedly, I wasn't able to get through this whole book. It's, uh, oh, come on. It's rather, rather thick. <laughs> what were you uh, doing? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm just wondering if you could maybe um, let me, uh, let listeners know, when you talk about keep it comfortable and controlling heat versus cold, et cetera, are you also in that section talking about relative humidity and, and I guess, you know, not just heat and cold, but, but the amount of moisture in the air? It, it is mentioned because as you say, it is very important and part of comfort is the combination of managing temperature and humidity because certainly how you manage humidity affects how much energy you need to uh, control comfort. Uh, less moisture, less uh, energy need. But uh, humidity is covered in much more depth, as you might imagine, in the keep it dry chapter. But we did try to uh, uh, make sure under, if you have a keep it, uh, or a issue that multiple keep it principles might be related to, there may be an emphasis in one chapter, but pointing out additional details in another right. chapter. They're, they're not distinctly different yeah. chapters. They, yeah. they do interrelate. Larry, I wonder if you could maybe quickly mention the people that you'd like to thank for helping put this together. Boy, uh, <laughs> first of all, um, E for the Future provided some funding to bring this together. Um, and we had a, a steering committee. I will probably miss people, but people like, you know, Amanda Hatherly, um, Joe Medosh, um, Paul Francisco, Ellen Tone, all people you know, um, yep. put time and effort into um, making yeah. this happen. Um, Amanda, and, Amanda Reddy and Jonathan Wilson. Oh, yeah, Amanda and Jonathan. And, and actually, when we wrote the um, thank you at the beginning of the uh, book, we, the acknowledgments we had to keep going back and we remembered other people who contributed to this process. So we've actually p published three editions of the acknowledgements at this point. Yeah, um, I should point out Jonathan Davies and uh, Rick Card uh, also were uh, contributors and, and my wife, Christy too. Mm -hmm. and, and Kevin, did you, did you do quite a bit of the writing in here? I, I kind of noticed your your, your style a good bit is that he's the, he's the primary author you're the primary author. yeah i wrote yeah. about i wrote about 95 percent or so yeah um wow. uh and but you're you're making a point i'm i'm glad you see it as my style but but really the intent was to try to do plain language so you uh, uh, are one person who knows that for years hud supported the national healthy home training centers and a essentials guide and that guide, uh, well, there really wasn't a guide. Uh, it was sort of a book of PowerPoints. Then they came out with a guide. And that guide was kind of steered pretty heavily towards uh, public health, towards codes. Uh, um, didn't have a lot of the basic uh, concepts related to each principle and why they matter. It, it was a good guide, a good starting point, but our goal here was to write something in plain language to try to explain things, to try to reference things clearly. There are about 300 references for all of this, and Larry's put a, a bunch of them on the website, so uh, you can go and find the exact reference if you want to know more about that specific uh, question or issue. Yeah, and, and clear graphics and, and photos. So I, the intent was to make it more of a, a plain language and, and offer good explanations of things and current information with a little bit in the introduction about uh, the history, of, but not too much uh, of that detail, more of it as context than as uh, a, a lengthy explanation. And, and, and to add on to that, we have had conversations about taking this reference guide and um, streamlining it a bit for homeowners, yeah, for people a, in homes. A healthy and, home owner's manual, if you will. <laughs> I think that would, be, that would be an excellent idea. Then your people who are doing this could hand that out as they go in. And, uh, exactly, exactly. You know, this is the 
outline of what we're doing here if you want more detail and and let's let's break through halftime and then when we come back I, you mentioned the introduction kevin that's something i find very interesting i guess i'm i'm a history guy so you know my, mm -hmm. my degree is actually in history and uh secondary ed so I find that very interesting. I'd like to talk a little more about that when we come back. Let's stop and thank our sponsors. We'll be back in 90 seconds with Kevin Kennedy and Larry Zarker. IAQ Radio Industry sponsors are Particles Plus engineers and manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org. The American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA. Healthier workplaces, a healthier world. Learn more at AIHA.org. And RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research. Learn more at SiriScience.org. That's C-I-R-I Science.org. A-C-G-I-H, advancing the careers of professionals working in the environmental health, industrial hygiene, and safety communities. Interested in defining their science at A-C-G-I-H.org. Okay, we're back. We've got Kevin Kennedy and Larry Zarker. Guys, I, I grabbed my healthy housing uh, reference, reference manual. manual. This was the HUD document I believe you just mentioned. Uh -huh. And um, I was a little confused at first. I thought the new document was an update of this, but apparently, obviously, it's not. Uh, no. it's, it's a quite different document. Yeah. Is this one still available, Kevin? Is that that was a not, free download at one time? It's still a free download. It's not printed anymore by the federal government, but it is a, a free download. It isn't necessarily available directly from uh, HUD, but CDC has a website for that manual where all the chapters are available online and they have done some updates. I believe that the last time that was published was 2006. And if you go to that website, uh, it's kind of quirky. You can down, you can download chapters or sections of chapters, but you can't download a whole uh, manual. But that that one is still relevant, and I'm glad you held that up because uh, not enough people are aware. Uh, there you go. Are not a number of people are aware of the history part that's in that that is really excellent. It's it's a fascinating. Uh, overview of the history of safe and healthy housing and how it evolved, how, how standards and codes even evolved in our country. And uh, uh, it's a good book to have on your shelf or to have uh, uh, for yeah. down. We, we included that in the resources yeah. session oh. on the website. Thank you, Larry. Okay. So that's available at the BPI website. <laughs> there you go. I, you know, I, I like that because it was, it was, it had a good section on HVAC and how, you know, the basic stuff that people need to know and that uh, people doing investigations need yeah. to know. But let's, let's um, change gears just a little bit. First, before I move forward, Cliff, is there anything you wanted to ask or add? Yeah, I just had one, one question for Kevin. Uh, Kevin, what has the response been of the homeowners? Uh, you know, whose lives have been improved, um, you know, at the beginning, uh, you know, are, are, are they uh, hesitant, you know, about letting someone in to look at the house and, and, and so on and so forth. And I suspect that if they do let you in, that that changes over the course of the uh, evaluation. So. Great question. Uh, for the most part, we get our referrals from the healthcare world because I work for a hospital. So uh, the referrals, usually the physician has said, 
or the healthcare provider has said, hey, uh, I think it would be uh, important and valuable to you to have a home assessment or to at least talk to the environmental health team at Children's Mercy. And when we get that referral, they don't automatically get a home visit, but we're going to talk to them about their home environment and, and what are their concerns and what are any potential issues. And we have a, a little bit of a formal process for doing that. So that helps us build a rapport with those clients. Uh, and uh, you gotta have, and we're fortunate to have this really good uh, staff who are really good professionals at talking with people, getting them to relate, getting them to confide as far as what their concerns are, what the potential issues are in their homes. People aren't always forthcoming. Uh, but even with that, even if you set that up and get to the home, you are absolutely right. There is still a little bit of anxiety uh, about, uh, not necessarily about, uh, uh, are we going to, you know, find the toxic waste dump in their backyard? It's more about, uh, like you said, having someone in your home, someone's going to walk all over the place and, and you see something. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it varies a little bit from uh, family to family. Some uh, are want to show you every little detail. Uh, we're going to go look under their bed. We're going to go look in their closet. We're, we're going to go look behind their toilet. We, but part of that is preparing the family, or the client for that kind of investigation, that kind of assessment, that you're going to be thorough. Uh, and uh, most uh, our experience has been that most folks are, are comfortable with that and they, we've built up enough of that conversation that they know we're trying to help. And that's fundamentally what it's about. If you don't show that you care and the research supports this very clearly. If you don't show that you care and that your uh, your goal is to help them, that you're not there to judge, then uh, you're going to have a very difficult time getting them to work with you and to be uh, confiding about issues. Because as you well know, a typical assessment, you're only there for a couple of hours and you're not necessarily going to see everything or measure all possibilities. So, uh, it's important to try to get them to tell you about their common practices and behaviors and um, uh, routines and cleaning, routines and household products they use, uh, how they might manage pests if they ever have any. Uh, all of those things are relevant to potential exposure. Fundamentally, the goal is to advise about and reduce exposure to environmental contaminants and improve the indoor environment. You know, it's, it seems to me that, um, you know, anytime you buy something from Amazon or whatever, you get these opportunities to review the product and, you know, give it a number of stars and so on and so forth. It would seem to me that uh, it would help your, uh, you know, I think both the marketing and the recognition of what you do. If you had some, you know, testimonials, you know, Cliff Z, Pittsburgh, Pence, you know, changed my life, changed my house. You know, my son no longer has asthma. Uh, so on and so forth. Do you do anything like that? We, well, I'll go ahead first. Uh, I was at a conference in Portland and um, it was a year and a half ago and one of the contractors actually was capturing that information from his customers. Mm -hmm. One was a case of uh, a woman who um, had two kids um, on inhalers and um, she was scheduled for thoracic surgery and he came in, um, she lived uh, next to a, a home that was heated with wood. Uh, her house was very leaky and so they had a lot of s smoke in their house and uh, he came in and did air sealing, put in an ERV with filtration and um, actually was able to control the, um, the particulate matter in the house and he used uh, air advice. Uh, product prior to, during, and for several weeks afterwards. And, you know, he said, look, this is tiny data, but she never had her surgery and the kids lost their inhalers. So, you know, I think that kind of case study does help. Um, it's absolutely going to help the private uh, consultant. And there, the research evidence certainly shows you improve the environment. And in most cases, you're going to see some kind of health benefit come from that. We're in a little bit different position. And I'm glad that Larry described that. We work for a hospital, so we're covered by privacy laws. So we really have to be careful about uh, seeking permission, about uh, having testimonials. But we do get them, and we have on occasion had uh, television news stories about uh, a home visitor, about uh, our program in general, 
and uh, our, our guys, our staff have been great about uh, uh, just engaging with the news folks because it's, it's, it's a good opportunity to talk to people about some of these basic uh, impacts, you know, simple things that can uh, impact your health. The cleaning products you choose uh, uh, alone can potentially have an impact on you or your children's health. So uh, it, it, we get it occasionally, but we, we, we have to be careful in our case. But I, I think that uh, I, like Larry mentioned, and I've heard from others that, uh, that those who have done uh, 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 private assessments or, or investigations have seen tremendous uh, improvement for uh, the residents. And, and uh, heck, a lot of folks I've talked at, at uh, the Healthy Building Conference that, that you and Joe put on, uh, that's often a, a talk of our conversations is people sharing some of the cases and, and gosh, the debilitating conditions that people live. And that's really probably something that most people don't realize is the sheer number of houses that, that have problems that people uh, just cope with. Uh, it's, it's stunning. And uh, look at the American Housing Survey. We mentioned it in the book, but if you look at the American House, anybody can go look at that on the census and you can run an analysis. And they now, in the last uh, survey, they added questions related to moisture and mold. They added questions related to smoking, to some of these other things that weren't there for years. And uh, they added some additional stuff about pests. And what's surprising, you can break the data down by income level. So you can have it show you what percent of people by income level reported a pest problem in their house. And what's surprising is the number of people in all income brackets. This isn't like a uniquely uh, low income issue. It is a housing issue. And you find it, uh, these issues in all uh, kinds of housing, whether it's people who make more than $150,000 or $200,000 a year, or whether they make less than $30,000 a year. Uh, the problem is the people in low income levels don't have the financial resources and capacity to change it. So they're the ones who are more often uh, living with it. But that doesn't mean that uh, upper income people don't live with it. The reason people live with these conditions, is they don't realize or recognize that it's actually impacting their health. Yep. I like to use the analogy of a glass of water. Everybody's immune system is like a glass of water. And for most of us, the glass is low. It doesn't have much in it because your immune system can manage what's being exposed to. But the more things you're exposed to, the more your immune glass of water fills up to the point where it overflows and your immune system overreacts or is overwhelmed and people have symptoms and problems. But it may not be from one thing. It could be from the combination of things or from how the whole house is acting as a system to expose them to different different environmental conditions, whether it's through air pressure or moisture dynamics or whatever. I've got um, a follow-up to something Larry said, and then a text question from a listener. First, um, this was a question I had put in my notes anyway, Larry, and either one of you can comment on this with the, I think, undercovered um, fire issue we have going on in you know, California, Oregon, Washington, the, the effect on indoor air quality in people's homes and buildings has been just dramatic. Is there anything in the, in the book about that particular topic? I know, Larry, you mentioned that, you know, you had uh, a testimonial from someone that lived next door to someone that was burning, you know, a wood burning fireplace or, or wood stove or whatever, but this is probably much, much worse. Is there anything in the book on that? Yes. Uh, Which section talk, would that be in? Uh, well, off the top of my head, it's, uh, I think it's in uh, either in contaminant free or maybe in... Uh, Could be in ventilation. In ventilated. Uh, yeah. We talked specifically about, people think about tobacco smoke. We also talk about marijuana smoke. That's becoming much more common, especially in, uh, where it's being legal. It's legal in so many states now. So it's mm -hmm. a potential indoor air quality concern. We talk about vaping, but we also talk about wood smoke, wood smoke and fire smoke. Uh, uh, and then there's some links to some really good EPA resources on uh, the health impacts of wood smoke. Uh, so that that's touched on in the book, but not Maybe it needs to be touched on more because, good God, the, the amount of fire. I have uh, relatives who live on the West Coast. Their, their photos and images outside their house are uh, astounding. 
and they have their own personal air monitors, one of these portable air monitor devices, and they are in their house. They're even uh, very high, uh, even with yeah. the windows closed and ventilation systems on. So uh, it's a really scary time out there. We, we touch on the health ramifications of uh, smoke. Yeah, and, and, and if you think about it, um, my kids were, um, all three of them were in Ventura, California, and just a couple of blocks from the Thomas fire um when that started and and they worked in the community um so they were exposed to a tremendous amount of smoke um, i later actually was at the neha conference and sat in on a session talking about what was in that smoke and it was really scary because you know the the houses that were being burned were pre-1978 houses with lead uh had cadmium mm -hmm. And other things in them and that gets into the smoke and they uh, reported that the winds came one day and and pushed all the smoke out to the ocean and they thought that they were free of it and then the winds changed direction and came right back um, so you know I'm very concerned about that and I, do, I don't think we have ventilation systems that can um, remove that level of um, Particulates. Particulate. Yeah. yeah. Well, another yeah. thing that yeah. I don't think we talk enough about, and something that Cliff is very knowledgeable on, is you know that smoke leaves behind a film of particulate dust that is potentially very hazardous, and cleaning it is a little different than cleaning normal dust and dirt that accumulates in a home. Absolutely. And it's packed full of carcinogenic chemicals, uh, PAHs and all sorts of stuff in those residues. And, and people don't recognize uh, how significant that residue is as a, as a potential health hazard. And if you heat a house up, those, uh, the third hand smoke, if you will, there's a class of chemicals that when you heat a house up to a sufficient temperature, re-volatilize and get back into the air. And there's even been a study of third hand smoke related to tobacco smoke that showed some of those uh, chemicals re even 20 to 30 years later because they have been absorbed or, or sit as residues on surfaces and you've never brought the indoor environment above a certain temperature. And when you do, then the physical property of that particular compound, it re and then people are exposed to it. You know, there's another um, current event that's way way undercovered and i'm wondering if there's anything i don't know that your book is is really geared toward this but the hurricane laura and, and the the flooding that occurred after hurricane laura i mean it was on for a day um, those people are still without electric they're still bailing themselves out they're still dealing with all the you know the leftover water contaminants and the mold and everything else. Do you have much or anything in the book on uh, recovering from floodwaters? Uh, there, under Keep It Dry, there is some discussion related to uh, that as one category of moisture management and uh, it touches uh, some on mold, but really, yeah. Remember, this is a reference guide that's going to provide an overview and then connect you to additional resources that will give you a whole lot more detail. But we certainly talk about uh, the impact of chronic wetness, chronic dampness, and uh, the resulting microbial agents and the yeah. health impacts. Of that. Kevin and I were on a panel at the ACEEE conference in New Orleans in January. It seems like 10 years ago, but um, we were talking about climate resilience. So we were looking at ma major flooding, major wind events, fires, and the like. And um, it's, it seems to be getting a whole lot worse. Yeah, I mean, the federal right. payout on disasters in the last two years, I read that it um, surpasses the last 20 years combined. And it's... Laura was what that. the most intense hurricane to hit the coast in in uh, twenty years, something like that, as a category yeah. four. Well, there's another. I got a text question that, that's related to another current unfortunate pandemic, um, and I'm, uh, the the question is, um, with so many people working from home, how does that affect a healthy home assessment? Are people still are they worried about your people coming in to do an assessment? And then I would have the same question for Larry and, and the weatherization people. I would imagine that people being afraid to let contractors into their home uh, has been, you know, tough on business. Absolutely. As you say, uh, 
when we talked earlier, uh, once uh, the pandemic had really become significant, uh, everybody's work shut down. Uh, we from the hospital were sent home March 13th and we have not been back. We've been working from home ever since. All of our activity out in the field was stopped uh, because of potential risk. And actually, we weren't allowed uh, by our institution to, to uh, go to even work with patients until uh, late this summer. And uh, we, like many organizations across the nation, have converted to virtual assessments. The good news is in, in the healthcare world, uh, our hospital had to stop all clinic visits, all healthcare visits. So, I mean, the, the, as a business model, that pretty much uh, was destroying our ability to deliver healthcare services. But the, fortunately, uh, we have been very strong in uh, the development of telehealth, of virtual clinic visits. And our hospital has converted something like 80% of our clinic visits over to virtual. Uh, and uh, uh, the good news is what Medicaid, Medicare, and health insurance, if it hadn't already quickly uh, approved reimbursement for telehealth visits. And as an example, in Missouri, they quickly approved home virtual assessments as an approved reimbursement for a home assessment. So we have developed uh, virtual protocols. There are many in the home performance world, many in the public health world, uh, uh, housing world who have developed uh, virtual uh, assessments and, and we've converted, we have a multi-visit model, so we've converted many of our touches or interactions with a family over to virtual interactions. The families actually love it because uh, as Cliff alluded to, they don't have somebody coming into their house necessarily, but you, you, you have a set time. There's no drive time. There's no drive back time. It's a set time you meet and then you're off. And that for the families, that's, you know, that's that quick right. two hour block. So there's a lot of uh, people are receptive to it. We have developed protocols for when we go into homes. We have not, uh, we have approval to go, but we're still watching the, the community infection rate and some of the other thresholds to, for comfort level. And then we're trying to minimize, uh, in our case, when we would go. And most programs are doing the same. And Larry can certainly speak to that. Yeah. Well, and, and we've been working with Paul Francisco, um, also um, um, others within the Building Performance Association and NYSERDA to look at how we go back in safely into the homes. And um, Paul is part of the ASHRAE committee um, looking at uh, the use of the blower door and they developed a protocol that um, essentially can um, depressurize a house uh, where you would, you would actually open doors and windows and bring fresh air into the house so that you remove potential aerosols from the air. Uh, you would ask the occupants to not be there during the period of time when that's being done and then try and limit any kind of contact in the home. Um, but that protocol, uh, I just saw a, a release from NYSERDA yesterday that they're going to have um, the contractors be able on the single family side, go back into homes and, and use that protocol to help. Don't they use the blower uh, door air. at the end as well? Yes. So before and they, and they go they, in and after. Yes, they clean and disinfect any of the surfaces that they touched. Hmm. Interesting. Cliff, so you had a follow-up? Yeah, I, I did for, I, I, for, for Kevin. Um, the, the question is, um, I guess, billing and, and coding and, and, and so on and so forth. For, for people that do this type of work, Kevin, whether it's your hospital staff that's doing it or whether there's an outside assessor that's doing it, how, do, how does the fee structure go for, for doing this? Uh, well, for us, uh, you, there, there's either uh, just straight fee for service you pay and somebody does an assessment, or if uh, you can make the attempt to get a reimbursement from any insurance company or, or private insurance or Medicaid, but um, historically we had luck with that uh, in the mid 2000s and then uh, once we switched over nationwide to these PPO networks, uh, it was considered an out of network service and they just wouldn't pay for any kind of home indoor assessment or indoor air quality investigation or anything. So for us, it's uh, it, 
we provide it, our families, many of them certainly can't afford it. So our hospital through its community benefit, which all nonprofit hospitals have to show community benefit, uh, our services provided at no cost for that. With uh, the, again, Missouri is one of the only states that has this Medicaid reimbursement. So the process there would be, you have to be a registered and approved assessor, but once you are, you get a referral from a provider uh, you contact the family, you offer the home environmental assessment. Once the work has been done, you can submit an invoice directly to Medicaid and they pay. And as I said, uh, there's no reason why people shouldn't ask on a managed care side if they could get approval for that. And there's, there's a, a lot more willingness and there are managed care companies in different parts of the nation that are actually outside of Medicaid, outside of Medicare, are actually... Uh, uh, reimbursing for uh, some kind of healthy home environmental assessment. In most cases, that is specifically related to asthma as a disease because the research evidence is pretty robust showing the benefit of home visits. It's part of the asthma guidelines, actually. They specifically include environmental control as one of the four core elements of effective asthma disease management. And uh, it recommends home visits by uh, a knowledgeable person to educate people about uh, how to reduce exposure, mostly to allergens, but uh, there are many other what they call triggers uh, that might be in the environment like smoke and soot, like uh, fragrances and chemicals that are not allergens, but are absolutely a potential trigger for uh, asthma flare-ups. So uh, the, the, the industry is moving slowly towards uh, approving this. As I said, as we move towards a focus on preventive care, you gotta have professionals who can step in and make recommendations to clients on how to improve the environment. And, and with, uh, the research is becoming, and it's always been pretty robust as for those of us likely on this call, that the environment is, is closely related to uh, the general uh, quality of life and health of people uh, living in homes. And if it, the environment's poor or the air quality's poor, uh, people struggle. Uh, if, if the environment's damp, the, re the research is very clear on chron living with chronic dampness. It's associated with some 15 known health conditions and the development of asthma. People shouldn't live in chronically damp homes uh, with the associated microbial agents that may, may be there. Yeah, a word about that. You know, m m our people like building analysts may not be mold specialists, but they can determine how the water got in there and make changes to the structure to prevent that from happening. And I think that's an important dis distinction. And it's a very the important. most important part. Yeah, exactly and, right. And I think they all work with or know people who can, you know, come in and do the remediation and, and the right. cleanup of any contaminants. And, and, and within the weatherization assistance program that the DOE sponsors, uh, the reauthorization language for this year coming up uh, actually, for the first time, allows the weatherization uh, grantees to, it, at the discretion of the Secretary of Energy, address health and safety concerns, not hmm. just focus on the energy. So, and, very important. Yes, very important. And uh, many of the houses ha were deferrals. If you had water coming in through the roof and causing rotting and mold, they had to walk away. Now, the language says that you can make a house weatherization ready and correct those problems. So that's a big change. Big change, yeah, excellent. excellent. And next year, there'll be some significant funding coming from HUD. Uh, there's a NOFA out right now that's, uh, that funds uh, the combination of weatherization and lead and healthy home programs. You can apply for one of $5 million grants for your community to, to do both weatherization work and healthy home work. Uh, in homes. Uh, people should look that up. But also in the next fiscal year, there uh, is clear uh, evidence of major budget increases related to addressing housing. Uh, that's one thing from our complicated uh, political situation. Uh, there's an agreement on both sides of the political aisle that uh, housing uh, it needs a, a major infrastructure investment and that there is a 
uh, as you all know, an overwhelming amount of, of housing in poor condition, whether it's privately owned or publicly owned. And uh, you'll see, as, as Larry just alluded to, some major uh, opportunities for um, being involved in healthy home work, whether it's assessments or whether it's the actual interventions to improve housing. It's, it's encouraging to hear that, um, you know, you, you seem pretty optimistic uh, about the future of the Healthy Homes Movement, and, and, and I think that's really encouraging for me and, and for many of our listeners. Hey, it's uh, right at one o'clock. Before we go, though, let's give you the last word. Anything you'd like to add that we missed or any final thoughts? And Larry, maybe you could tell people where they could get the, the book. I think you may have mentioned it once before, but let's, let's finish with that. Okay, um, so the easiest place to go is bpi.org forward slash HHP. And this is uh, information about the Healthy Housing Principles Certificate of Knowledge. And you can um, actually uh, get the reference guide either through digital or in the printed copy. Fantastic. Kevin, final thoughts? Uh, just to appreciate you guys having us on the show and letting us kind of give you an update on uh, mm -hmm. the whole healthy housing world. And uh, uh, I, I would be very interested in working with, collaborating with others to create uh, more awareness about uh, the importance of really uh, of this guide as a foundation. I, I firmly believe that anyone who touches a home would benefit from, uh, from having this kind of knowledge and having the certificate. So the more... I think we get uh, the healthcare sector having this knowledge and the housing sector, contractors, construction workers, housing professionals, nonprofits, you create a common language, a, a common language that, that everybody is using to communicate as they look to improve housing in their community and overall uh, make the community they live in a better place. So uh, I think this is just one starting point. Yeah. I think I got another request by text, but I think what I'm going to do is, I think that's Phil. Uh, I'm going to hook him up with Kevin direct to see if he can get you a link oh. to that chronic. Well, I can see it. I can see the text. It's the, uh, the best reference to look at is a, uh, uh, it's, what's his name? Uh, Mark. Uh, Mendel. Mendel, thank you. Mendel's uh, systematic literature review from 2011 uh, has a real nice overview. Just look at Mendel and systematic review of dampness in homes. Also the 2008 uh, WHO document on indoor air quality, dampness and mold uh, was a, another one of those that provided a nice systematic review of literature and what health symptoms are, are known to be associated with a chronic dampness. So those two documents for sure. The, the, uh, the Mendel uh, is from 2011, so it's an update of what the WHO literature had looked at. And, and if he needs a link, I, I'm happy to provide it. Well, it's thank you. Too. Thank and you it, might even be, it might even be at the, the BPI website. There you go. <laughs> if not, we should put it there. <laughs> if it's not, we'll have it there, right? Yeah, that's right. All right, gentlemen. Thank, thank you, you so, so much for much. having Kevin us. Kevin Kennedy, thank Larry you, Zarker. Much. Really appreciate you guys joining us. It's been too long. We won't let it pleasure. go this long the next time, Kevin and uh, Larry. It's always a pleasure having you on. This is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to this week's guest, to my co host, the Z Man, Cliff Slotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. We're back live and uh, we'll be back next Friday at noon with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. <laughs>